Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Andrea Sankey. He promised to crack down on the illegal drug trade, and his supporters say he's delivering. Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte has called on soldiers, police, and even citizens to kill those involved in drug crimes. Now, since he took office at the end of June, more than a thousand people have been killed or gone missing in what critics say are extrajudicial acts encouraged by a leader with no regard for human rights. Now, over the weekend, Duterte reaffirmed his shoot to kill order, promising immunity from prosecution. Today's newsmaker is Rodrigo Duterte as we ask if his zero tolerance approach to the war on drugs is letting people get away with murder. The human cost of Rodrigo Duterte's war on drugs is rising, and now he has officials in his sights. On the weekend, Duterte named more than 150 people, including mayors, judges, and police with alleged links to the drug trade. We will not stop until the last drug lord, the last financer, and the last pusher have surrendered or put behind bars or below the ground. Since he took office in June, more than 700 suspected drug users and dealers have been killed by police or vigilantes. Another 2,700 people have been arrested, and more than 114,000 have turned themselves in. The country has to build new jails because of the overcrowding, and the president says this is just the beginning. Shabu is the country's most popular drug. It's the poor man's cocaine, a type of methamphetamine mixed with caffeine. The Philippines has the highest rate of shabu use in the region. In 2014, almost 90% of drug seizures involved shabu. Successive governments have tried but failed to eradicate it. The man known as the Punisher made clear promises on the campaign trail to end the problem. Three to six months ago, I will eradicate corruption, criminality and drugs. There's no end in sight for the crackdown. Duterte promised to wipe out crime with the shoot-to-kill policy he used while he was mayor of the southern city of Davao. And he's not apologizing for the spate of extrajudicial killings since he became president. Human rights cannot be used as a shield or an excuse to destroy the country. But rights groups and international drug authorities are calling for the deaths to stop. They say the vast majority of those killed are not wealthy and powerful drug lords, but mainly small users or even innocent people. Natalie Pohanan, The Newsmakers. Well, Richard Hedarian joins me now from Manila, where he is a political science professor at De La Salle University. Richard, thanks so much for joining us. First, help us understand the dynamics of the Philippines, for those of us that aren't familiar with the country. Why would a huge majority of the public want to see this kind of controversial, iron-fisted leadership in a president? Well, uh, just a few months ago, the Philippines was considered as a beacon of liberal democracy in East Asia. And in fact, it's one of the oldest democracies uh, in the developing world. Uh, but since the campaign period, uh, it seems that President Duterte, or when he was still a candidate, was quite effective in communicating a central message. And his central message that it was that the biggest problem in the Philippines is the lack of rule of law. And the proliferation of drugs and uh, rampant criminality is a reflection of that fundamental problem, and it has to be dealt with through draconian measures if necessary. And I think it's not only a question of the campaign strategy and the effectiveness of the rhetoric of President Duterte. I think statistics also show that crime, uh, index crime, has increased over the past few years in the Philippines as the economy picked up. Uh, statistics also show that between one to two percent of the population, so that's around two, two million people, have been uh, addicted 
to different kinds of, uh, of drugs or methamphetamine uh, kind of products. So there is a basis for that. And of course, the Philippines, compared to certain neighboring countries like Singapore or Malaysia, seems to be a less safe place. But of course, a lot of experts will tell you that the Philippine situation, as far as law and order is concerned, is not as bad as Latin American countries like Mexico or Venezuela. And they will tell you that, of course, the issue of criminality is huge, but it's not the number one problem in the Philippines. But I think so far, President Duterte has been able to convince the public that he needs maximum public support and maximum support also from other branches of the government to deal with this issue in a swift manner. He promised to deal with the issue of crime in three to six months and we see within the first month in his office he has already accelerated crackdown on criminality and drugs. Now so far it seems that there is an international outcry. Some allies like the United States have already spoken out against this. Liberal media and the intelligentsia are very critical but it seems the vast majority of the Filipinos are not very much opposing this. In fact, the latest survey suggests that more than 91% of the Filipinos have expected trust and support for the new president. So it seems that these liberal values and, uh, of civil rights or due process don't seem to be as much embedded in the Philippines. And I think it, it's clear that what's happening in the Philippines is something common all across democracy in the world. I mean, in the United States, you have someone like Donald Trump saying that we should torture the families of suspected terrorists or ban all Muslims from entering America. And yet he is garnering significant su support among the electorate. So I think no surprise that in developing countries in the Philippines, many people are saying maybe it's time to focus on safety before issues like due process and civil rights. Okay, Richard, this crackdown, though, does center specifically on drug crime right now. So I want to ask you another perspective question since you are there living it. How bad is the drug problem in the Philippines compared to counterparts, not just in Asia, but in the Western world as well? Well, definitely, I think many would say the Philippines issue with drugs is not as bad as it is uh, in the United States or it is in, in parts of Europe, for instance, or in parts of Middle East, like Iran and Turkey, which are close to Afghanistan, for instance. So I don't think the Philippines is significantly worse than, off than those countries. But there is a sense that not only drug proliferation, but crimes in general, like kidnapping, car napping, uh, hijacking, uh, so on and so forth, these are huge issues. So I think it's not just the issue of drugs, it's an issue of law and order. And if you look at Duterte, he has been quite effective in pushing this rhetoric, uh, which is similar to the rhetoric of other neighboring countries like Singapore and Malaysia, mm -hmm. the so-called Asian values. The idea behind Asian values is that in Asian societies, unlike in the West, what matters is not the individual, what matters is the community. So if the civil rights of the individual serve as an obstacle to advancement of the collective interest or safety and security for the rest, then the individual rights can be compromised or be suspended temporarily. And I think that was his message during his State of the Nation address when he said that, uh, for instance, human rights should not be an obstacle to advancement of the national interest or should not be used as a shield for undermining the nation. And for better or for worse, of course, for Democrats, this is not a good thing. It seems it resonates with a lot of Filipinos. And a lot of Filipinos visit neighboring countries like Singapore and Malaysia who have more draconian and stricter measure against crime and trafficking of drugs, among other things and they say that those countries have a safer society so why can't we have a more safe society and the other thing we have to keep in mind is this Duterte is doing this in his honeymoon period uh, in his first hundred days in office okay. uh, presidents tend to have a lot of public support and I think I think that is why we don't see a galvanized okay. opposition to him yet but what is interesting in part about this approach is that he is also punishing drug users for example hundreds of them if not thousands have gone to turn themselves mm. in because they're scared and now they're being placed in Philippines notoriously overcrowded prisons to what end what social purpose does that actually serve won't they come out worse potentially well the first thing that we have to keep in mind is that uh, Duterte's approach to fighting crime is actually much more comprehensive than shown in international media actually one of the first thing that he emphasized is to overhaul or revamp the Philippine penitentiary system uh, one of the plans was I think to create some kind of an Alcatraz high security prison to put the uh, you know the, the highest levels of criminals there and also he wants to get rid of policemen or officials who have been corrupt or colluding uh, with criminals
criminal elements. So I think his approach is not only focused on cracking down, but is also in terms of overhauling the penitentiary system. But this will take a time. But there has been some movement on that front. Now, with respect to uh, allegations of extrajudicial killings, the thing is that we are yet to wait for the Philippine Commission on Human Rights to come up with comprehensive support. And, and of course, the Commission on Human Rights at this point in time, time doesn't seem to have the maximum support of the government. So we're yet to see also a thorough investigation on what is going on on the ground. And the other thing is that sometimes there's a gap between what Duterte says and what happens uh, in reality. So, uh, okay. of course, many people are worried by his kind of blusterous rhetoric, but it remains to be seen whether he has given actual uh, executive order for extrajudicial uh, kind of activities. And I think okay. this is why we're still in the level of allegations, but nonetheless, there's a huge concern that things may get out of control. It may get out of control, and so far the international community is, is starting to react. We've seen condemnation from the United Nations as well as the International Narcotics Control Board. Arguably a bit slow in coming, some human rights organizations have said. But the United States mm. is being pressured mm. more and more to step up and do something about this. So might increasing international pressure on Duterte change his policies, or will he even care? Well, so far it seems that Duterte has his own mind. I think on certain issues where he feels strong, when he feels he's really right, and he has an effective track record, it seems that he has proven less pervious to international pressure. But I think that it's possible that if international pressure increases, uh, and more pragmatic voices with his within his government begin to speak up, then I think it's possible that he may move to the next stages of war on, on, on crime. We see that, for instance, what, 600,000 people have already surrendered to the government and have volunteered for rehabilitation, for among other things. And I think the rhetoric we're beginning to hear from certain quarters in the government is that the focus now is not only on cracking down, it's also on providing rehabilitation. It's also about overhauling the penitentiary system. So it's possible that amid international pressure or perhaps based on his own personal volition he may move to the next stage of dealing with the issue of drugs I think from Duterte's point of view what he wants to show here is that he means what he says that the things he said during the campaign period were not empty promises and he's trying to show that he's a man of his words but I think at some point it's possible that not only because of international pressure but because of his own calculation and his own assessment he will move to the next stage and say that maybe it's time uh, to stop uh, much more uh, aggressive measures and it's time to focus on issues like rehabilitation and reintegration of people who have surrendered to the government. As I said, hundreds of thousands have actually surrendered to the government uh, and they have volunteered for rehabilitation. I think that's the next stage of the war on crime or in war on drugs uh, that Duterte might need to deal with. Okay, Richard Haidari, and we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us from Manila.